Hi, I'm DJ Ware. Today on the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be taking a look at, well, uh, my first video log, and we're going to be talking about security for those servers that really are used in the cloud, but this could apply to any kind of servers which have exposure to the broader internet as well, or contain sensitive data. Stay tuned right after this. So one of the things that I've been involved with over the years has been in security from the standpoint of not only the physical uh, premise, but also the servers and the firmware and the software and the data that resides on it. It's a complete end-to-end -end thing. So I thought I would kind of dice this up <clears throat> a little bit and share with you some of the information that I have both learned over the years and also that I have collected over the years from the National Institute of Standards, or NIST. I'll include a, a link to an article that goes into this in more depth. So if you want to read more about it, and there are some use cases in the back of the, of the article if you're interested in applying this in situations that you may have, whether that be a cloud or whether that be a data center that hosts information that, that you do not want uh, exfiltrated, and some information about some techniques and ways to be able to do that. So that's what I hope to cover today. And, and really, there are three forces that impact security. I mean, there's probably other minor ones, but these are really the three biggest ones. The first one is that there's been an introduction of billions of connected devices that you know provide an increased attack surface. You don't know how well those devices have been secured. You don't know how well they've been managed or taken care of. It's kind of the Wild West uh, as to what is attaching to you. So, uh, also the hacking has been has become industrialized. That is, there are very sophisticated automation tools which can be used not only to gather information but also to inject malware into systems, as we have seen over the past couple of years and continue to see <laughs> as we go down into 2020. Uh, and the third problem that, uh, that we've all seen in this industry is that there's so many different players that are out there that are providing software and services, and there's no coherent and consistent adoption of security controls. And <clears throat> what the uh, NIST attempt to, has, is attempting to do here is to provide at least some basis in what you could uh, uh, in in applying good practices along the lines of hardware security. How do you verify that the platform is still maintaining the integrity that you believe that you had when you first set it up? How do you protect the data within it? And then how do you remotely check to see whether or not the system is still in compliance with what you had set up? So that's what I'm going to talk about today, just at an introductory level. I mean, this is another one of those talks where we could go on for four to five days. Uh, there's a lot of things in here that, but I'm just going to cover some of the highlights for you. And again, as always, that's kind of my thing, right? Here's some stuff that you might be interested in if you want to dig into it more. Uh, there is an awful big, large wealth of information about this topic that's out there. So hardware security, what are the threats that we have to worry about? Well, first is unauthorized access and exfiltration of sensitive platform and user data. Platform data could be anything from firmware files to configuration files about the platform itself and, of course, user data that's contained within it. Uh, <clears throat> the, some of the threats are modification of the platform firmware. This would include the UFE, the BIOS, board management controllers. We've certainly seen those problems in the past. The manager, uh, manageability engine, the MEs, and also even the PCIe devices have firmware, and those can, be, uh, can inject malware into your system if they are programmed appropriately. Uh, also, um, supply chains could intercept uh, physical replacement of, of equipment with malicious and substitute malicious versions of those devices that you would then install into your system and find that you now have uh, software that is attacking your system. 
uh, access to data or executable uh, execution of code outside of regulated geopolitical boundaries. So, in other words, I have data being exfiltrated or I have code that's being executed from sources which are are not intended or or even uh, or even recognized as being part of the the uh, platform that I am building. <clears throat> Also, uh, you might find that uh, one of the other threats is to circumvent your software and or firmware-based security mechanisms, because once they get around those, then uh, again, they can do whatever they want, and so those are definite threats. But how how do we mitigate? I mean, some of the things that we can use to mitigate against this. And again, we don't talk about how to solve it because you can't. I mean, all you can do is is manage the risk. Uh, and this is a game, this is a arms race, right? So I put it something in place, somebody else defeats it. I put something else in place, somebody else defeats it. So, uh, so the first thing we have is platform trust. We need to have some assurance that the integrity of the underlying platform configuration, and that includes the hardware, the firmware, and the software that supports it, uh, is something that I have established, that this is something I know that works, it's trusted, it doesn't have malicious code in it. That forms my root of trust. I have to have a place to start where I can chain the rest of the trust mechanisms from that. Uh, and all the security controls must have an, an ROT, a root of trust, and that is an implicitly trusted zone. So this particular piece I trust implicitly, and that will be the form, the, the basis of a chain of trust, which extends up higher into the stack, both hardware, firmware, and software stack. And uh, <clears throat> that is then called the chain of trust. Hardware accelerated disk encryption is another way to mitigate, of course, that's data at rest. Uh, and also we have uh, today, we have offerings with, uh, which also encrypt uh, the uh, memory base and memory, which provides isolation uh, and then gives us one more area that we can mitigate. And basically what you're doing here is I encrypt the disk. That takes my data pool that's exposed from this large to now I have memory encryption and now I have a data pool that's exposed that's this large on the memory. And if I encrypt that, then the only memory that's exposed is that bit of data which is currently being operated on. So it's really reducing the amount of data that would be available for exfiltration. That is the thought. <clears throat> so it provides, obviously, we're trying to reduce the attack surface. And the second thing, we're trying to mitigate the direct access or the modification of firmware. And if it has been modified, we can detect it. Uh, and that detection comes from the platform integrity verification. That's comprised of actually assigning cryptographic measurements of the software and the firmware. We know about this. We've done this in, in our, when we download distributions, we have cryptographic keys that are assigned to it that identify that this software from the particular uh, uh, the developer or team of developers has been verified to be exactly what they intended, exactly what they built, and have put up for you to download. It gives you a way to compare it. It's similar to that in the platform area as well. And also, it, we extend it to not only the uh, file of ex that it's executable, but also to its configuration as well. So we want to make sure that we have the correct, verif we have the correct uh, versions of the firmware and that we have the configuration that you're running on and that hasn't been modified in any way. Uh, the other facet to this is kind of is is kind of the next step, right? So once I have the encryption keys, I can unlock the system and allow it to start production work, provided it's met all of the verification steps. If a verification step fails, I can have the software turned off and not allow the server to run anymore until the problem is addressed, so you take it out of service. Uh, <clears throat> also, I have automated methods for firmware and configuration recovery from sources that are trusted within the, the chain of trust uh, is in the event that I also encounter a verification uh, step that fails. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the areas where hardware security modules, which again are expensive, <laughs> But those are the places I can then store uh, <clears throat> measurement data, verification information, cryptographic keys, all kinds of stuff. 
can be stored in that and then access to those can obviously be controlled. So this gives you kind of an example of a platform integrity verification. This is kind of a chart that you might use that looks at the different pieces within, like I have defined my root of trust, I have defined recovery, protection, and supply chain, and then there are checkoffs that go along each step as we go through the verification tests uh, as the system is being powered up and, and built up for the first time. The next area is data protection. <clears throat> so uh, data protection not only includes the data of the users or the data that is being operated on, but it also includes, if I have a virtualization environment, it also includes the virtual machines. So, so the advantage of a virtual machine over any of the others is that it simulates hardware and the firmware within it is controlled. That is, I, I don't, <clears throat> I have hardware abstraction layers that are in the virtualization which control access to the underlying firmware, making it more difficult for an attacker or a malicious uh, user to be able to get in and modify the firmware on the physical hardware itself. So, and it also isolates each workload. So each vir virtual machine is in turn isolated from another virtual machine which is running on the same physical hardware. Uh, all, and that allows me also then to, once I've established that as being trusted, I can then encapsulate that VM, pull it off or copy it, and then move it to another, another platform and start running on it. Containers provide convenience, however, you may be at risk to kernel space vulnerabilities because they're, they share the same kernel space. Uh, and then those shared layers that are in with that the container is using can make you susceptible to more widespread exploitation. So yeah, that, that's, that's, I mean, containers have their, their uses and they have their risks. Uh, the best way to run a container is under a VM. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of instances today where uh, the, the, the container management systems, particularly those under foot, uh, systems like uh, Clear Linux and Fedora uh, Silverblue, which are actually allowing you to create those, in, those skinny uh, virtual machines and then encapsulating the container under it. There are a number of technologies like that. Also, encryption at rest. I mean, we're, we want to we want to reduce the print print, footprint of the data that's exposed, and so we encrypt that data uh, so that while it's sitting on the disk, it, it it's not in any readable format. Also, even while it's being used, it still protects the data that is around it on the disk. Now, the data that is pulled off is unencrypted. But if it's moved into encrypted memory, again, it's protected while it's being stored in memory. And the only exposure you would have would be when it was execution, executing. And there are processor designs which are on the boards right now, and there's some that are coming out this year which uh, have encrypted, encrypted execution uh, within their streams. How well those are going to work and how good there's gonna, they're going to be, time will tell, right? Um, okay. Finally, we we have then this is this would be a similar to a guard, right? This would be what a guard is, a trusted execution environment. That is an area or an enclave. That is, it's a self-contained uh, system, which is is protected by a system processor. In other words, it's used to lock up data, uh, sensitive data, encryption keys, authentication strings, or even data that's intellectual property. And it has, and only communication with that TE can occur over, but from specifically trusted devices that have specifically designed interfaces and specifically designed cryptographic keys, which allow them to unlock and attach and connect and retrieve the data. So yeah, that is a true guard or a TEE. It kind of goes a step beyond a guard. Uh, and finally, uh, we reach uh, this step, which is remote attestation service. So, <clears throat> all right, my system's accredited. I'm up. I'm running. I, I've got everything going. How do I make sure it stays in compliance? Well, that's what this does. Uh, that is measuring the system's firmware and its configuration to make sure that each piece of firmware, each configuration that's on the system on each server 
is still the same as it was when it was accredited. And it has to be automated because many cloud environments today have thousands of servers and it's just not possible for system admins to run around and try to manage all those or to try to run these tests, collect the results and decide what to do. The, once the remote attestation service verifies the server firmware, it can also include policies which exclude firmware and measurement of specific devices that cannot be modified. So yeah, and then that wouldn't, uh, and that this R RAS uh, actually enforces the compliance across all hardware systems in a data center. So you collect a report uh, and it tells you what's going on with each system. It tells you that you either you're, you failed or you passed compliance uh, during each run. How often you run that is up to you, and this is an example of how that might be used in a, uh, in a remote attestation service. So, to, to wrap up, we've kind of talked a little bit about the need to verify the firmware, the configuration, and the software. There's more to this security talk, and I'll be probably doing more of these uh, types of vlogs later on as we progress down the line. But you have to form a root of trust, and then you create the chain of trust with the root at one of its accesses. And that goes into the higher components of the software. HSMs, or hardware security modules, are, are useful to store the cryptographic keys, the sensitive information, the configurations, and data, which is intellectual property. So HSMs can be TEEs. Uh, <clears throat> they are a very, as I said, a very expensive one. But Again, it's like all things, how far you take it is dependent upon how much, how, how much you have to lose if, you, if your data were to be exposed and how much you're willing to, to budget in order to protect that data and the, and the, and the operation of your systems as a whole. Uh, automation is needed in order to check the platform integrity because there's just, it's just too much to be able to ask a human being to do and then make sure that the security configurations are, are, are right. Now, the question you always have is, if you're automating something, what checks it, right? What makes sure that the, that, the, uh, that the system that's doing the verification is in compliance and hasn't been modified to exclude out the system, the part of the system that have been modified. So you have to keep that particular part of the system under pretty tight lock. Um, the benefit to all this is that you can take this, this collected data that comes out of the RAS and that can f be extremely useful when you're doing compliance audits. So that's kind of what I had today. I mean, I, this is more of a server topic. It's probably not something for us to worry about on home servers, but it maybe it gives you some thought and some things to think about even for your home services. So I hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, hope to see you again in the next video. And and bye for now.